to welcome everyone to the Wednesday night class. I have the privilege of, of presenting a lesson for tonight. Of course, in in uh, compliance with long-term tradition, I'll only be talking 10 minutes. <clears throat> I'm not sure which 10 minutes, though. But anyway, you may recall that we uh, recently completed a lecture. And I thought it was a very good lecture, too, in various topics. One of those topics was the uh, necessity of a continual study of Holy Scripture. And that's uh, necessitated just by the very nature of Scripture, what it is. <clears throat> the study and, of course, restudy of the Bible will yield a, a better understanding of what the Scripture is teaching. <clears throat> it's not because the teaching was not, uh, was not there when the passage was first studied. Uh, with each subsequent study, the teaching will be the same as when studied the first time. But what has changed is the additional insights gained from uh, continual study, a continuation of the study. Also, there is a matter of uh, maturation of the student through age and experience in, in conjunction with the application of the things that are learned. Now, I want to consider tonight uh, the first two verses of chapter 8 of Romans. You might just want to turn over there because we'll be referring to it from time to time. But it reads, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. <clears throat> of course, when you consider these verses or any verses you have to be studying, it's, it's best to discover the purpose, in this case, the purpose of the letter to the Romans. After all, these two verses are uh, within a certain context at the time of writing. So what did it mean to the ones to whom Paul was writing? And what was Paul trying to accomplish in writing to them? If we can determine that, then we'll know the uh, purpose of the letter. Of course, the overarching aim of all scripture, in the particular the gospel, is salvation. That is, ultimately, to get one into heaven. As Paul writes in Romans, the first chapter, verse 16, he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The context of the letter was the impact that the Judaizing teachers were having on the church and would continue to have if their doctrine were allowed to be embraced unopposed. The inevitable result would be a Gentile church and a Jewish church. Paul tacitly acknowledged this problem in Romans, the 15th chapter, verses 22 through 32. And you can, you can read that, uh, but it, it, there, there he was said, I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. But he mentions it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution to the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. Therefore, he goes on to say, uh, when I have performed this, that is, delivered the funds to the saints in Jerusalem and have sealed them uh, to the fruit, I shall go by a way to, uh, to Spain. So he was going to try to visit the uh, brethren in, in Rome. And he says, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. It goes on to say in verse 30, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, <clears throat> and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you uh, with joy by the will of God, and may be refreshed together with you. <clears throat> so he's dealing with the, both the Judaizers and the non believers Jews. But the Judaizing teachers, uh, they were primarily Jews from Jerusalem. 
uh, they had accepted the gospel as from God and Jesus as the Messiah. But they were insisting that the Gentiles who uh, rendered obedience to the gospel of Christ also had to be circumcised and keep the old covenant. That is the uh, law of Moses. In order to be pleasing to God, <clears throat> the collection in the just cited passage was by Gentiles in Macedonia and was to be delivered to the poor Jewish saints in Jerusalem with the additional purpose of making the Gentile Christians more receptive to the Jewish Christians and, of course, the Jewish Christians more receptive to, to their Gentile brethren. In addition to the relief provided, it was to promote the truth that there was just one church, not two. The doctrine that the Judaizing teachers were advocating was not so radical when compared to what denominations today are, are advocating. <clears throat> the Judaizers admitted that one had to obey the gospel and Jesus was the Christ. But they added something to that. That is, that the Gentile Christians additionally had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. As uh, Paul said in the first chapter of Galatians, verses 6 through 9, any addition to the gospel preached by the apostles was a dis different gospel. Not really another gospel, but a perversion of the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> the Judaizing teachers were, therefore, teaching a perverted gospel, and Paul would have none of it. Denominations today are teaching doctrines that never occurred to the Judaizers. Nevertheless, the Judaizers were promoting a perversion of the gospel, and Paul was doing his best to prevent that occurrence. A question that needs, to, needs an answer is this. If Paul was not happy with the Judaizing teachers of his day, how much more would he condemn the denominational doctrines of the day? The answer is much more. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 16, noted previously, Paul indicated he would like to visit the Christians in Rome and then journey to Spain to continue his evangelistic efforts among the Gentiles. The phrase churches of Christ is not a scriptural term that provides an exclusive name for the church, yet it is a scriptural term. It does show that the church, church universal is a plurality of individual, individual churches comprised of Gentile churches and Jewish uh, churches. They in the aggregate make up the one body, whether located in Judea or Rome, or spring. With respect to the Judaizing teachers or anyone else who might pervert the gospel of Christ, Paul wrote the following as recorded in uh, Romans the 16th chapter, verses 17 through 18. He says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn. <clears throat> That's the apostles' doctrine. And avoid them. For those who are, are such do not serve our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. That's what the Judaizing teachers were doing. <clears throat> well, this is the background of the book of Romans. Of course, uh, it is also an answer to the, to the Jews that either rejected the gospel outright or as noted in the letter to the Hebrews, we're thinking about going back under the pure law system that it that is a law of sin and death. That's the mosaical economy. The gospel that Paul preached offered an escape from the law of sin and death. Salvation was available to Jew and Gentile alike in the same body, the church, according to the same terms, the gospel. Paul wrote that he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes the gospel. For the Jew first, because it was preached to them first, but this is not an indication of the superiority or preference. And also for the Greek, that is the Gentile. 
under the gospel, as Paul recorded in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All must now approach God in the same manner. All will be saved in the same way. All are entitled to the same blessing. The flip side of this is that all the lost will be lost in the same manner. The gospel is a system of faith, whereas the law of the Jewish system was a fleshly system, that is, a law of sin and death. It was never intended to be permanent. <clears throat> As noted by the prophet Habakkuk, and of course in many other passages, in uh, back up to verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 4, the just shall live by his faith. Now keep in mind this lesson is not intended to be an in-depth discussion of the letter to the Romans, but only a very brief analysis of our passage under consideration. However, this passage is in the section of Romans that addresses the problem of sin and its solution. The eighth chapter is a is the conclusion to that section. So again, we read, "There is now, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit is in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death." And the phrase "no." condemnation is music to the ears of the denominationists of today who says that one need only ask Jesus into his heart to be saved and thereafter can never be lost. <clears throat> uh, this, this of course is not the only music that tickles their ears. Now this doctrine is taught nowhere in the New Testament. The Judaizing teachers were converted to Christ that you know, they believe the gospel once delivered. They repented, they confessed, they were baptized. Yet they were teaching a gospel not delivered by the apostles. Uh, Paul said in Galatians, the first chapter, verse 8 and 9, that if anyone taught any other gospel than the one the apostles preached, or one that the Galatians had not received, they were to be accursed. The Judaizing teachers were doing exactly that. Therefore, they were accursed. The Greek word for accursed is anathema. The word does not denote punishment intended as, as a discipline, but divine condemnation. That hardly supports the false doctrine of once saved, always saved, or any other false doctrine for that matter. <clears throat> With respect to any false doctrine, the words of the writer of Hebrews recorded in Hebrews 6, chapter verses 4 and 6, are as follows. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Now to be renewed again was one must have been renewed previously and then fallen away. What does it mean to be enlightened? To have taste of the heavenly gift, to have become takers of the Holy Spirit, and taste the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. What does all that mean? Well, this is speaking of a state of salvation, something from which the individual mentioned here is uh, fallen away. Many other scriptures not mentioned for lack of time, refute this false, false doctrine of once saved, always saved. Of course, uh, scripture rightly divided refutes any false doctrine. The import of this is that there is condemnation under the gospel system. But our passage says no condemnation. Uh, what are we to make of that? When a word uh, such as condemnation is used here in the negative, and we can prove scripturally it is not a universal cessation of its application, then it is being used in a different way. Scripture does not contradict scripture. 
in our analysis, then we must not overlook little words because they can have significant bearing on our understanding of what has been taught. The words, quote unquote, therefore, and quote unquote, now are just such words. The word therefore means that there is a conclusion to follow based on preceding arguments. The word now means that there is something different from then. Considering all the arguments that Paul has made that uh, refutes the doctrine of Judaism teachers, we conclude that the then was the law of Moses, a pure law system that only condemned that the Judaizing teachers were trying to impose on the Gentile Christians. The Old Covenant made no provision for washing away sins, but didn't the faithful under the law of Moses have their sins remitted? Yes, they did. But the question <clears throat> is when such remission occurred since it was not available under a pure law system. As Paul wrote in Romans third chapter verses 19 through 26 in part, you, again, you can read that at chapter three, verse 19 through 26. He says, you know, we know what the law says. <clears throat> uh, but in 21, it says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus and on all those who believe. He goes on to say that um, he uh, <clears throat> showed his righteousness but in his forbearance. God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. He hadn't done away with them, but he passed over them to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one ha who has faith in him. <clears throat> so there is a time that uh, those sins are committed in the old term is going to be completely wiped away but it had to wait until the cross but people those people could treat it as if they were uh, those sins had been washed away now in the case of uh, verse uh, 8 1 and then now in verse 321 contrast the law which could not make anyone righteous with the righteousness of the gospel which Righteousness was wit witnessed in the old law by the law and the prophets. And it was witnessed in the types and shadows of the Old Testament. In Romans, the seventh chapter, verses five through six, Paul wrote, when we were in the flesh, remember the law was a fleshly law, the old law, the sinful passions were, were, which were aroused by the law, the old law, were at work in the members to bear fruit to death. But now, again, there's that small word, now as opposed to then, <clears throat> we have been delivered from the law, the law of sin and death, having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The nows in these verses are the nows of Christ and his gospel is contrasted with the then of the law of Moses. Those who lived in the law of Moses before Christ <clears throat> could not be saved apart from the atoning power of the blood of Christ. Since Paul points out that if those who lived in the law could not be saved except through the blood of Christ, it is false, therefore, to believe that the law can now save <clears throat> after the coming of Christ. Under the gospel system, it could neither condemn that is the old law, since it was fulfilled and was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14. Again, I repeat that the law of Moses was a pure law system. It condemned, but it could not save. It was never intended to be permanent. It was taken at the cross, taken away at the cross. Of course, we know from our studies that most Jews rejected Christ while the Judaizing teachers pretended to accept him. Their insistence on holding on to the old law exposed their pretense as a lie. Since the old law could not save the Jew, how did the Judaizing teachers conclude that it could save the Gentiles who were never on the law of Moses? Paul notes 
that there is a place in which there is no condemnation. It is in the righteousness of God apart from the law, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, Jew and Gentile. Or as Paul writes in <clears throat> the uh, fifth verse of chapter one and the 26th verse, verse of chapter 26, it is through obedience to the faith that is the faith of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel, the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3. It is God's power to save, Romans 1 16. This salvation, or as our verse says, no condemnation, that is, no condemnation now, as contrasted with the condemnation then, is available in the gospel and not the law of Moses. Keep in mind that man has always been under some law system. As our passage says, we are now under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that is the gospel. It has freed us from the law of sin and death, that is, the old covenant. The gospel is never referred to as a law of sin and death, but it is a law system nevertheless. And where there is no con condemnation, as the scripture says, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Of course, one must get in Christ Jesus for there to be no condemnation. As Paul stated, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's Galatians 3rd chapter, verse 27. This is how one gets in Christ. Again, I want to repeat the passage. And, you know, we want to have this pretty well in our minds. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. <clears throat> we are not to walk, to walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So what does it mean to, to walk according to the flesh? Something the Romans were not to do. The word flesh can be used in two uh, senses. Flesh can be used for the, the works of the flesh, as set forth in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 19. And uh, certainly we should not walk uh, therein. That is, our manner of conduct we shouldn't walk if the flesh and desires that are enumerated there. Also, the word flesh is sometimes used as a synonym for the word Judaism or for that system. The old covenant left its subjects in the flesh where it found them. The old covenant was addressed to them as men in the flesh. Neither righteousness nor, nor eternal life was enjoyed in it. Even those that had lived under it could only be saved by the provisions of a better covenant. Covenant, Again, it's what we read in Romans 3rd chapter. The Judaizing teachers sought to bind the law on Gentile Christians and, in doing so, only left them in the flesh. If the old covenant was a covenant in the flesh and apart from the new covenant, it left the Jew still in the flesh. What could it do for the Gentiles but leave him where it found him, that is, in the flesh? Paul insisted in the Roman letter and other epistles as well that it was not the flesh that made one a child of God. Those who are children of the flesh, he wrote, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. That's in Romans 9, chapter verse 8. <clears throat> Who are the children of God? They are the children of promise. The children of promise cultivated in Christ and the gospel. And are those who are children of God by faith in Christ. Uh, when baptized, Galatians, again, 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 26, 27. In answer, answer to the Judaizers who were disturbing the Christians at Corinth, Paul stated, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. That's in 2 Corinthians 5, chapter 16. 
I say again, the law of Moses, which was a was a fleshly carnal law system, was in, never intended to be permanent. As recorded in Hebrews the ninth chapter verses nine and ten, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him perform the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with food and drink, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. The writer further states in, <clears throat> in the 13th chapter, that uh, 13th verse of that chapter, that the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers, the sprinkling of the unclean, sanctified for the purifying of the flesh. In all these passages, the word flesh is a synonym for Judaism or the old law, if you will. Romans the seventh chapter verse five further clarifies the meaning of in the flesh. It reads, for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. In the flesh of this verse is equal to being under the law, the old covenant, Judaism, which was the fleshly system. This is included in its use in Romans eighth chapter. Finally, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, establishes the fact that in the flesh is used in reference to Judaism. It reads there, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are you now being uh, made perfect by the flesh? As previously noted, it was the blood of Christ flowing to both sides of the cross that washed away sin. We may conclude that the cond condemnation mandated in the old covenant is what is being referenced in our passage into consideration. But that is not all this passage says. <clears throat> it talks about walking according to the Spirit. Spirit is sometimes used as a synonym for the gospel of Christ. The gospel is spiritual. The old law is fleshly. The old covenant was only the shadow of the better things to come. The bondage of the Jew under the old covenant is contrasted with the liberty and freedom and in the new covenant. In 2 Corinthians 3rd chapter verse 6, Paul says that the apostles are minister, ministers of the new covenant, that's the gospel, not of the letter, that's the old covenant, but of the spirit, that's from whence the gospel uh, comes, which is the new covenant. For the letter, the old law, kills, but the spirit, that's the gospel, gives life. As a children's song, uh, song says, we learn from the old, but we are saved by the new. Of course, the spirit could also refer to the, to the miraculous. After all, this was a time in history of the miraculous. During this time, <clears throat> when one was baptized, he did not receive a baptismal certificate in a Gideon Bible. I doubt there was anything like a certificate. But there's no written Bibles available to the public. The gospel was in men who were memorializing their gospel in written form by their letters. The importance of these letters were recognized. The letters were meticulously copied and widely circulated, but not would not be assembled into a written volume, that is, what we call the New Testament, until many years later. Well, how then was one to know if a writing and its human author was authoritative? It was through the miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit, which confirmed the credentials of the apostles and the inspiration of what they taught. This was in contrast with false teachers who were, who were uninspired and who could not con uh, confirm their teaching by a miracle. But I will come to you shortly. Paul says, if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, that's the Judaizers, but the power, that's the miraculous, for the kingdom of God is, is not in words, it's not just what somebody says, but it's when it's confirmed in power, 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verses 19 and 20. So he says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, 
as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake, First Thessalonians, first chapter, verse 5. The direct operation of the Spirit not only provided a revelation, but carried with it the miraculous manifestations, which were the credentials of the credibility of the gospel. The credibility of the gospel is now found, found in the Bible, New Testament in particular. The credibility of the ones that proclaim the gospel is measured by the, gospel, by the Bible. The preacher today proves his message by the Bible, not by miracles. You need to refer to the 13th chapter, verse uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, this accounts for the language used to contrast the gospel and its messengers with false teachers who opposed it in the apostolic age. The heart of the Roman letter is Paul's defense of the gospel in opposition to Judaizing teachers. It is an answer to all the false claims of these teachers. So there is condemnation of the gospel in the gospel. It is a law of sin and death, but only to those who are not obedient to the faith. Whereas the old uh, could only condemn, the gospel can save. Our appeal then is that all, even you know those listening tonight in particular, but all will render obedience to the faith once delivered. It is God's power to save, and it is God's only power to save. Thank you for your kind attention.